40,000 miles flat out around the world. Always raced, always rallied, and always with the accelerator pressed firmly to the floor. The Volvo Ocean Race boats had a tough life last time round. Crews did their best to stay on top of routine maintenance and repairs. You know what they say, a good guess is better than a bad measure. Some boats were pushed harder than others and faced a bigger task to get their show back on the road. A tough life was what the identically matched Volvo 65s were designed for. But a high mileage, pre-owned machine that has been flogged for nine months by a crew on a mission might not be your first choice for a second lap of the planet. Yet this is exactly what is in store for teams in the next race. A race that will break new ground for an offshore fleet of high-tech, carbon fibre rocket ships. Of the eight boats that will be on the start line this November, only one is brand new. And yet, so far, none of the teams that competed in the last race have chosen the boat in the new wrapper. Or indeed, the boat that won the last race. Such is the confidence they have in the fully refitted fleet. Nick Bice describes himself as... Chief Technical Development Officer. I gave myself that name. To everyone else, he's the boss. And the founder of the boatyard. But whatever his title, Bice and his team broke new ground in the last race with a bold experiment. To maintain the entire seven-boat fleet with one shoreside operation that followed the race. A touring pit lane for the Volvo 65s and a first for the offshore racing world. So the boatyard started off pre the 2014-15 race with the plan to help reduce the team's overall budget by offering services, pooling the spares, by basically grouping all those things that teams are doing individually to try and reduce that overall budget but not having an effect on the actual team's performance like asking Formula One drivers to hand their keys to Bernie Eccleston for a service and valet before the next Grand Prix. The plan was a bold one. Yet this is precisely what Bice's team did. We had a pretty special system set up from the, um, between the shore managers and us, being the boat yard and the suppliers as well. Essentially, the boat could send a job list to the shore manager. The shore manager would then input it into what we call a smart sheet, and that would generate reports that get sent to either the head of the department or the actual supplier in anticipation for what is coming up for the next stopover. We were servicing the boats for the leg coming up, so we were proactively servicing, not reactively servicing. So we gather that was around 95% of the servicing done was proactive and only 5% reactive. One design boats, it gave us the opportunity to be as open book as we wanted. And uh, those job lists that were being sent off the boats, I would print them out and stick them up in the boatyard for the public to even see. So everyone knew exactly what was going on. In the past it was an advantage or not, I'm not entirely sure, to keep secrets. And sometimes the boats arrive at the dock with the shore crew not knowing what to do because it's been such a secret. But there are no secrets about what happens for the next race. The Volvo 65s were designed to do two races. Getting them ready for another circumnavigation involves stripping all seven of the existing boats back to their birthday suits and rebuilding them from scratch. A one million euro refit per boat. basically rebuilt the boats in this, this group refit that we've done um, in Lisbon this time around. We've done a lot of changes but we haven't fundamentally changed the uh, performance. We've got rid of a fair bit of weight off the boat to be honest. We could have spent a lot of money trying to put you know, lifting foils on a boat that's a bit heavy and it didn't seem the right thing to go and spend another million on something that would give a 5% gain or something on its wonders on. It's not the bit that's going to change whether it's a successful race or not.
But before they could rebuild the fleet, they had to build themselves a facility that could handle seven large race boats in a row. No easy task. The answer was a disused fishery in Lisbon, converted into the Volvo pit lane and made ready for the Grand Prix production line. So yeah, day one of, of this boat's refit, uh, disassembly, where we've lifted the boat out of the water, taken the mast out, and we're going to set up to take the boat off the keel now. So this boat now uh, is in its third week uh, inside this bay. The boat builders are still doing some modifications to this boat, and the painters are getting all the paint off the deck, and they're going to start um, sanding the hull to get a bit ahead for when it rolls into the uh, painting booth. Now it takes five days to strip a boat when it comes into the first bay. And, and at this point in the process, now that we know it, it's probably 60% of the time it would t take to do it if you were just, here's a, a container full of parts and let's start putting things together. So that's every three weeks, another one rolls out and it feels like it. you just got done with a tire change and here comes the, uh, the B car in for a fresh set. The hardest bit is probably the shaping of the boat. So once we've stripped off all the old branding, we then go into, we put the materials back on the primers and then we, we go into the shaping where we use uh, big long drain pipes with sandpaper on, four guys all together like this and just and just sand and shape the whole boat up. That takes us about three days to do that, but that's probably the hardest bit. A lot goes on in this bay. Every single component that was taken off the boat uh, has been serviced and is now going back on. It's also getting tested, so every single department has a go on here. This boat's coming out of the, out of the spray booth in three days' time, and uh, as you can see, it's looking very red, so you can guess which boat it is, but uh, they've still got to do the final coat on it, they've still got to do the non-skid on the deck, and they've still got to paint a few components, all that in three days, so um, it's a massive, massive show of teamwork effort in here at the moment. That red boat was Mabfrey, one of the first to be relaunched in her new colours, ready for testing and crew trials. But despite the intense level of scrutiny, sometimes not everything goes to plan. Shortly after she was relaunched, Mabfrey broke her mast during an offshore training run. A frustrating and acute reminder of the fine line that teams tread. one good thing. Nobody got hurt. But sometimes the failures are intentional. It's very uncommon to have the, the chance to, to, to destroy something that someone else has built so carefully and so accurately. But uh, this time uh, we broke uh, this carbon part for something worse. While reliability is key, so too is the need to ensure that the fleet is evenly matched. The current boat that we're sitting on, which is fully ready to go, weighs around 12 and a half tonnes. And the difference across the fleet between the eight boats is 36 kilograms only on the whole boat. And that 36 kilograms then actually gets corrected. So when the boats are actually sailing, the boats weigh exactly the same. So the performance from the boats comes purely from the crew the next edition of the race, these boats will be about two knots quicker. Now that's actually due to going to the Southern Ocean and sailing downwind and in different wind strengths. There's a whole new sail wardrobe being added to the boats, which is a refined wardrobe from the last edition, from what the designers have learnt. So the boats will be quicker from that point of view. Each boat has taken 6,000 man hours to refit during which time over 750 parts have been removed, serviced and refitted. By the time the last boat has been launched, the Lisbon boatyard will have clocked up a total of 42,000 man-hours to produce a fleet that is fit for another flat-out lap of the planet.